Okay, Annie, why don't you just uh, share your screen and uh, take it away? Thanks, Magnus. I hope I'm audible. Uh, my name is Anirudh Basu. I uh, head up something called Emerging Business at an American multinational in the networks business called Marvineer. Today, I thought what I'll do in the next uh, roughly eight to nine minutes is give you a little bit of a perspective on why we feel uh, from an industry standpoint, uh, why private mobile networks is going to be a bit of a game changer as we enter into the 2020s. So let me start with a few numbers here. Uh, the year 2020 was pivotal in many aspects, uh, but let me not dive into the COVID, uh, the, the COVID elements of 2020. Why it was also pivotal was that the size of the digital universe uh, last year, uh, according to several reports, hit uh, about 44 zettabytes. That's 44 followed by 21 zeros. That's a shed load of zeros. Essentially, if you add three more zeros to that number, you come to the end of the decimal table. Uh, this is the sum total of all bits and bytes of data uh, across sensors, devices, uh, data in transit, that constitutes the digital universe today. And that is actually, as a number, larger than the number of stars in the known universe. The reason I bring this up is it took us from, let's say, the 1830s to the 1870s when the telegraph and the telephone were first invented, about 100 odd years to really connect places, homes, offices, uh, business places, plain old telephony services. It took about 25 to 30 years uh, starting from the late 70s, early 80s, to connect the first billion people. And that was essentially mobile telephony uh, that, that started with, with pre-3GPP, pre-2G days, to then 2G, 3G, and 4G. But all of that essentially was around consumer transformation and connectivity and providing the means for individuals to connect, exchange voice and data. And that really led to the digital revolution, the app store constructs, the digital economy, in the last, uh, since the first iPhone was, was deployed in, in way back in 2006, 2007, the whole construct of innovation over the network stack. What's fundamentally changed now is this digital transformation construct is now not just about consumers, it's about uh, consumers, enterprises, and industries also being able to connect and fundamentally use both mobility, connectivity, and data as the central pivotal points for, for their transformation journeys. What's also happened in the last three to four decades is most of these networks that you're aware of today, uh, mobile network providers, fixed network providers, uh, have been managed by communication service providers, some of whom are on the call today. And together with uh, infrastructure vendors such as ourselves, we've done a fantastic job, I would say, in the last three to four decades in being able to get to a stage where there's more than 7 billion connected devices or subscriptions. There's more than five and a half billion smartphones on the planet. Pretty much everybody is connected. What's changing fundamentally now is uh, with the advent of uh, demand drivers from the industry and the enterprise side, uh, it will no longer just be CSP or communication service provider managed networks, but increasingly more enterprises and industries are looking to own, manage, and deploy their own connectivity stacks as part of this digital transformation exercise. Uh, why, that is, why that is now becoming an increasing reality is, previously it's only been licensed spectrum that's been available in most of the markets globally that has allowed for interoperability, it has allowed for devices to be able to roam, for all of us to be able to communicate as individuals and consumers and enterprises. But increasingly there's more and more amounts of unlicensed or lightly licensed spectrum uh, real estate, if you will, the highways of the future for data connectivity that are coming up. What's also changing on the technology side is previously, most of the networks have been very appliance driven. That essentially meant that you had large vertically integrated products, you had switching centers, you had radio base stations, towers and masts that were very hardware driven. And uh, the entire technology stack was very vertically integrated, kind of like a Mac approach, my way or the highway. However, in the last 10 to 15 years, with the advent of horizontal platforms, which has been driven by increasing softwareization, the, the adoption of cloud-based principles driven by web scale entities like the big five or the big six, all of this stuff essentially has now meant that previously telecoms and IT as two large industries were at loggerheads on how network platforms and how innovation would happen. They were kind of insulated and isolated uh, 
segments. But now as we enter into 2021, because of all of these factors that I mentioned, the next generation of connectivity and networking will essentially mean that telecoms and IT will start to converge. We will move from a world where there's a, just a handful of technology provi uh, providers and move from uh, a world where there are proprietary oligopolies to much more open-ended, open ecosystems and a much bigger wave of what we call democratization of networks. That means the underlying connectivity stack needs to be much more accessible, much more programmable to allow for in industries, enterprises, such as a lot of uh, the folks that are present on the call here today, to be able to create value um, uh, over the top. This also means that in our industry, we need to move away from just very specialized telecom skills uh, to much more broad-based IT and IP skills. This will essentially mean that we'll move from a world where the legacy Gs like 2G, 3G, 4G that kind of supported the old order of things that you had to be very specialized in these kind of network constructs to a world where 5G will level the playing field, will broad base the technologies, will crowdsource much more innovation from smaller, medium and large companies and even individual entrepreneurs. The old world also kind of, uh, in terms of a geopolitical scenario, favored the status quo. Now there's been a lot of disruptive global events, both politically uh, as well as, as, as we know from the pandemic side that have really accelerated this change. And it, it is pushing more and more enterprises and more and more industries to try and figure out what they need to do to take much more ownership of this connectivity and data construct to drive their own destinies. And last but not the least, uh, one of the, the, the primary changes that, that we've seen in the last 10 odd years is a move away from consumption that is based more on capex and asset ownership to a consumption metric that is much more dependent on as a service models or an outcome orientation. Uh, private networks by, by, uh, by, by most of the reports that you folks might have read or if you're interested is slated to be on just the connectivity stack alone a $25 billion market by the year 25, 26. The amount of value that it will unlock, however, is at least 10 to 20 times as much in terms of operational efficiencies, in terms of new revenue generation, in terms of new service capabilities that will be unlocked by deploying such, such open-ended uh, underlying connectivity platforms. Now, private networks are not necessarily new. They've been around for a while. In many instances, operators have managed, let's say, walled garden approaches for national security, public safety kind of services, blue light uh, uh, kind of applications like the police forces or, or healthcare, but still managed under the umbrella of a larger macrocellular network. What's fundamentally different now and what's really picked up steam since 4G was launched in 2008, 2009, was Europe kind of took the lead to, to uh, showcase or underpin Industry 4.0 as one of the key drivers for the adoption of technologies like 5G and to ensure that all kinds of new and very specific industry and enterprise specific requirements would be baked into the standards of the next generation of connectivity technologies. So what's fundamentally new is new cyber physical systems, mission critical applications, production critical applications from operational technology segments and, and entities, which will drive things like industrial IoT, which will make uh, this, let's say 5G, and onward network constructs much more suitable and much more germane to this, to, to this new digital transformation activity that I just spoke about. There are four uh, primary reasons for, for private networks. Why, uh, why private networks when you have macrocellular networks that cover most of the world today? One of the reasons is it's guaranteed coverage in remote and underserved areas, for instance, in mines, uh, in, in, remote spa, in, in remote parts of, of, of the geographies, which are traditionally not served by, by mobile operators. There's a demand or a need from advanced industries for network control and certain network elements to apply configurations and use case based uh, uh, you know, capabilities that are traditionally not supported in a public consumer oriented network. And the last two being, there are very specific requirements that come in from industry 4.0, the very specific requirements that that will require profiles that support very demanding applications, very specific quality of service guarantees. And last but not the least, uh, there's, there's an increased focus on the fact that there'll be much more requirements uh, driven by security implications for these kind of connectivity platforms. 
to just give you a case in point, if you have networks that you know, serve 7 billion people today, and we are looking at tens of billions of connected devices, potentially each of those devices could be an attack vector into addressing or into, let's say, breaching the underlying connectivity platforms and networks that serve mission critical applications like utilities, waterworks, and what have you. So identity and access management, uh, privacy and data integrity, th these are some of the key drivers for, for mobile networks suitable for enterprise and industries. But that does not mean that CSPs or, or mobile providers or service providers will not have a role to play. There'll be two kinds of, of uh, private networks. One, we, one cluster is what we call dependent private networks, where these, these islands of, let's say, enterprise and industrial uh, connectivity constructs will be deployed in conjunction with the larger uh, service provider to allow for roaming, to allow for interactivity with the macrocellular pieces. But at the same time, there's increasing instances of independent private networks where there'll be no dependencies on a licensed microcellular network from a mobile service provider, but these will be much more self-contained, self-managed and, and encapsulated networks uh, run by the enterprises uh, themselves. Now, from an industry standpoint, there's, there's four things that I wanted to call out. There is definitely an explicit demand there is an un unmet enterprise need when it comes to very specific and very unique use cases that are not fulfilled by traditional consumer grade macrocellular networks. Things that require ultra low latencies, extremely high capacities that, that rival that of fiber, to being able to support things like time sensitive networking, some key requirements on, on, from an industrial standpoint. These underlying network constructs and demand drivers have been explicitly stated by enterprises and industry 4.0 uh, as, as requirements that networks need to support for them to be able to really leverage the capabilities of the next generation of connectivity and data. From a spectrum and regulation perspective, the good news is more and more countries and markets are actively working to make available license or unlicensed spectrum to allow for uh, industries and enterprises to manage their own uh, and deploy their own encapsulated networks. Germany, for instance, has launched uh, a scheme where for just about 10 to 15,000 euros, you can get 100 megahertz of spectrum uh, to deploy networks in your own campus, in your own manufacturing facility to actually drive operating uh, efficiencies. More and more countries in Europe, like France, like, like the UK, uh, countries in, in Northeast Asia, like Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, and of course the US with the CBR spectrum are early outliers in actually proving that there's a strong policy and regulatory push to allow for this industry transformation to happen, uh, supported by adequate spectrum and, and let's say re spectrum real estate being ma ma made available. From a technology evolution standpoint, 5G is a buzzword, but I think from, from my perspective, I'd say look upon 5G as a compelling event in the sense that it's one of those Gs where the IT and telecoms worlds would come together. Uh, it's, it's a time in our industry from a technology standpoint where it's not just about 5G, but it's increasingly about technologies coming in from, from web scale uh, providers like, like cloud uh, capabilities and increasing amounts of that allows uh, the increasing levels of complexity in these kind of networks to be abstracted down so that people can create value over the top. And the last point is, is something that I just wanted to underscore. It's critical that we collaborate and, and, and cooperate. Ecosystems are absolutely essential, which is why platforms like Things, which brings together technology providers, uh, service providers, application vendors, and consumers uh, from the enterprise and industry side, together to, to share ideas uh, and, and, and the way forward. Uh, what does the market say? Now on the left, you'll see and you'll, you'll get these charts. This was a word, word cloud that we, we came up with and polled a lot of our customers, enterprise and industries. You can see security, velocity, ecosystem, collaboration. These are some of the words that immediately come to mind. From an ownership standpoint, it's, the jury is still out. It's, it's expected that 50-50 will be delivered and, and deployed by operators and maybe will be owned and deployed and managed by enterprises themselves. And then we have the outlook on 5G where there's uh, early adoption of 5G as well as, as 4G in some of these industries going forward in the coming 24 to 36 to, uh, to even 72 months, we'll see much wider adoption of 5G technologies in these, uh, on, on these platforms. I'll just continue this slide. Uh, 
a little busy, but what I wanted to kind of say is, if you look at the left-hand side, these are all kinds of devices. And on the right, these are all kinds of clouds that those devices connect to. Essentially, for the last three to four decades, we have focused on one category of device, which is cell phones or smartphones connecting to app stores. But over time, from an industry and, 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 and enterprise perspective, there'll be thousands of different types of devices, whether drones or cars or, or connected cameras, connecting their relevant clouds and applications. What you need in the middle is a, a, an IT-centric network construct, which is multi-access, supports everything from cellular to Wi-Fi. It, it adopts the best building practices from cloud and IT, like cloud uh, edge capabilities and slices. But more importantly, it abstracts the complexity and allows for opening northbound to create what I enterprises, which will allow developers, bigger ecosystem of developers, tech companies, enterprises, industries, governments, and so on to create value and applications that are relevant for their segments over the top. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to listening to the rest of the speakers speak.